Harvard Divinity School. The Climate of Consciousness, November 1st, 2021.
Good evening, everyone. Good evening to tonight's weather report, the climate of now. We will be in conversation this evening with the brilliant, best-selling, and immersive journalist Michael Pollan, discussing the climate of consciousness, focus on, focusing on his work with psychedelics in his most recent books, This Is Your Mind on Plants and How to Change Your Mind. Charlie Stang, director for the Center of the Study of World Religions, will be joining us as a respondent with his deep interest in these ideas as well. I'm Terry Tempest Williams. I'm writer in residence at the Harvard Divinity School. And on behalf of the Center for the Study of World Religions, Religion and Public Life, the Planetary Health Alliance, in partnership with the Constellation Project, we're so glad you're here tonight to join us. We welcome you. We're live tonight with Professor Diane Moore and her students who are using these weather reports as curriculum for their class in religion and public life alongside directed readings and discussions. We're also joined by students engaged in our fire salon where we meet every Tuesday evening around the fire in the commons. This salon is being co-led with Ana del Castillo. We are here at the Braun Room in Sports Hall at the Harvard Divinity School, mindful that these are ancestral and traditional lands of the Massachusetts people, and we honor them, and we honor these lands. Special gratitude to Brian Kerbis of Theosophy for framing tonight's conversations with his beautiful and evocative tea pourings. Always sip tea as if tea is life itself, references Michael Pollan to the classic of tea. He writes, approached in this spirit of transcendence, the tea ceremony held the power to change consciousness. And it's this changing consciousness that we're going to be discussing tonight. I hope they're drinking tea in Glasgow at this very moment, as 120 countries convene in the name of this planetary climate crisis. With China's absence at COP26 and Vladimir Putin deciding not to show up, there are international concerns over what can be and will be accomplished. President Biden says, quote, this time America is serious about climate change, end quote. I hope this is true and that consensus can be found. The New York Times reports today, quote, underscoring the urgency of the moment with leaders of more than 120 countries facing pressure to immediately curb greenhouse gas emissions, the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, said that the effects of a warming planet were already being felt from the ocean depths to the mountaintops. Quote, sea level rise has doubled from 30 years ago, he said. Parts of the Amazon rainforest emit more carbon than they can absorb. And in the last decade, over four billion people have been affected by events related to climate change. Enough of burning and drilling and mining our way deeper, he said. We are digging our own graves. Our planet is talking to us, Mr. Gierte said. We must listen and we must act. Greta Thunberg's response, urgent action is needed now. The planet is screaming for help. Thich Nhat Hanh writes in his new book, Zen and the Art of Saving the Planet, quote, when you wake up and see that the earth is not just the environment, the earth is us, you touch the nature of interbeing. And at that moment, you can have real communication with the earth. We have to wake up together. And if we wake up together, then we have a chance. Our way of living our life and planning our future has led us into this situation. And now we need to look deeply to find a way out, not only as individuals, but as a collective, as a species." Unquote. The question can be asked, is the way out, as Thich Nhat Hanh defines it, the way in? to a disillusion of the ego, our egos, into a shared sense, an embodied sense of being interrelated and interconnected with all species on this planet we call home. Michael Pollan believes the mindful use of psychedelics 
is a way of making this essential connection. For more than 30 years, Michael Pollan has been writing books and articles about the places where the human and natural worlds intersect, on our plates, in our farms and gardens, and in our minds. He's the author of eight books, six of which have been New York Times bestsellers. Michael is currently teaching writing in the English department at Harvard and has taught at Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism, where he's been the John S. and James L. Knight Professor of Journalism since 2003. He's been described as part journalist, part historian, part social activist. Pollan's books, each of them, are movement builders, a catalyst for change, individually and collectively. Whether it is his mantra, eat food, not too much, mostly plants, or these pieces of common sense wisdom, shake the hand that feeds you. If it came from a plant, eat it. If it was made in a plant, don't. And in his words, quote, the way we eat represents our most profound engagement with the natural world. The skeptical, curious, and hungry mind of Michael Pollan has intersected with our own. As a writer and public intellectual, Pollan's ideas have become part of our cultural DNA. Whether it's the PBS two-hour special documentary based on Botany of Desire, or the Oscar-nominated 2008 documentary Food, Inc., which was partially based on Pollan's book The Omnivore's Dilemma, or his current involvement on a four-part Netflix series based on how to change your mind with filmmaker Lucy Walker, who we met in our first weather report, Michael is a writer who is changing the conversation around food and now our state of mind. No wonder Time Magazine named Michael Pollan one of the 100 most influential people in the world. I can tell you personally one of the great joys of being at Harvard for these past five years has been nurturing my friendship with Michael and his wife, the painter Judith Belzer. We are all the beneficiaries of having them with us. Their generosity of spirit is real. And all of us benefit from having them here in Cambridge every fall. Welcome, Michael. It's such a joy to have you here. Thank you, Terry. I'm so nervous. It's, well, I, I, it's just great to be here with you in particular. I've drawn so much inspiration from your work, especially since we moved from east to west coast. Well, it's just been a joy to get to know you and Judith. And I love that you said you would do this on one condition, that it be live. And I think we all thank you. Yeah. And so to be here um, live, unmasked, and present with our students um, and this global audience is, is such a gift. To so, me too. I mean, I've, I've had a, a year of, like everybody, of being on Zoom. I had a Zoom book tour this summer and really missed um, people. And I'm aware just the energy, it's so different, you know, than just the one-dimensional faces. Yeah. Um, so Agreed. thank you for that. What's the weather report from your point of view <laughs> from outside our world? Oh, God, I've been thinking about that a lot today because, uh, as you mentioned, COP26 is getting underway and expectations are low. Um, so I'd have to say, you know, cloudy with a 60% chance of apocalypse. <laughs> That's pretty high, you know? Yeah, it is say. high, but 40% chance of not. Yeah. I think that's pretty good. I remember when I started uh, researching psychedelics, Roland Griffith, who's one of the leading scientists who got psilocybin research restarted, and is a very spiritual man. He got into it because he'd had a mystical experience. He said to me, um, so what do you think the chances are that there's anything after you die? And I said, uh, one to two percent. <laughs> I don't know what to say. He said, that's a lot, that's a lot. <laughs> so 40 is even more. Yeah, no, and I think part of your optimistic spirit, uh, spirit is why we read you. Um, well, temperament has a lot to do with it, I think. People's um, politics, their philosophy, so much of it comes down to some basic uh, aspects of temperament that you're born with. And, and one is, of course, a basic optimism or a basic pessimism. And, and, uh, and so I do preface my hopeful talk very often with, I'm just a hopeful guy. <laughs> but I think that's tempered by your skepticism. Yeah, 
I mean, I do have the journal of skepticism without question and, um, and doubt. I definitely do. Um, but I found that not only is it temperamentally agreeable to write about hope, that it's necessary. Um, and that I, I learned this um, back when I was writing about the cattle industry. Uh, I wrote a piece for the Times that became a, um, uh, a chapter in The Omnivore's Dilemma. And I followed a steer that I had bought, five, number 534, through the whole meat system. And um, it is a very dark article about feedlot pollution and you know how we grow the corn that feeds the animals and how the corn makes the animals sick and that this is an, a fossil fuel based way to produce food. And at the end of the article, and it was very long, I had learned a little bit about grass-fed beef and, um, and wanted to write a couple paragraphs about that for people looking for an alternative who didn't want to give up eating meat after they read this piece. And I, it was not much of a market at all. It was just a few people doing it in an informal way. And, and I wrote about it and I said, Con contrast that food chain with this one where instead of oil feeding corn, feeding cattle, you have sunlight feeding grass, feeding cattle, feeding us. And it was three paragraphs at the end of an 8,000 word piece. And a market for grass-fed beef exploded like that week that the piece came out. And, um, and it taught me that people are looking to do something after they get their, their dark weather report. Um, and that if there is anything you can point them to, you're doing them a service and you're doing the issue a service. And um, so I think people are hungry for hope. And it's not something especially that investigative journalists think about or, or know about. Because they tend to have very dark temperaments. They, they see the worst in people and that allows them to do important investigations. It doesn't allow them to traffic in hope in any way. And so I, I think it's very important. If, I think we're obliged, if we can find it, to share it. And what would be your definition of hope? an alternative way of doing things, that there's another path, um, that it's not, that nothing's inevitable. Everything's evitable. Um, and that's a really important, you know, it's one of the reasons we study history and we see that very specific decisions led to specific outcomes. It didn't just happen. Um, we didn't just get this food system because it was the best way to produce food. A series of decisions were made. Um, and, and the same with the way we organize our energy economy or anything else. And so that if you understand those moments where history could have taken another path, it's hopeful because you see we can, we can still take another path. Um, that, that we're not, um, I think we all have, a, we're very fatalistic. We assume things are the way they have to be and they're not. I think that's such a good point. You know, we're in the midst of this climate collapse. We're writers. I was talking to Chloe Arigis, who's a Mexican-American uh, writer who works with um, Writers Rebel in the UK. Mm -hmm. And she was saying that her work as a novelist is parallel to her work as an activist. And I'm interested that you define yourself as an activist, too, which a lot of writers don't claim that. I do, as well. Um, she was saying that she's troubled that her work in fiction isn't more aligned with her political work. Mm. And I was thinking about your work with climate in so many ways, and you and I have talked about this, it shadows the climate crisis, but it's indirect. Um, can you talk about that and some of the pieces that have been more direct with, with climate and agriculture? Yeah, I mean, you know, my largest, my larger subject as a writer is writing about nature and our, and our engagement with other species in particular. I and mean, that's the kind of piece I bit off. And it, and it grew out of my work as a gardener. Um, I started writing pieces about what was happening in my garden and what I could learn about the environmental crisis in that intimate space. I kind of felt when I started writing that too much American attention literary attention had gone to the wilderness and that we weren't paying enough attention to the areas where we had to intervene, where the, where the idea of leaving things alone wasn't going to work um, and that we had 
preserved about as much as the American continent as we were likely to preserve as wilderness. In fact, we've been shrinking that um, under the last administration. Um, and that we needed to address the messier areas where we can't help but put our mark on nature, how we feed ourselves, how we live, all these kind of areas. And the garden was a good metaphor for that. Um, but even in my first book, Second Nature, climate found its way in. I, I remember there's some passages where I'm alluding to Bill McKibben's 1989 book, uh, The End of Nature. And critically, um, you know, I had some issues with that book. I mean, I look back on it and I'm kind of embarrassed, but because it's such an important book. I mean, it was... What really, were your issues? There was a conceit in that book that um, before we had changed the climate, which we just got the news of the year before from James Hansen's testimony in Congress, that nature had been natural and now it no longer was. And my point was, no, nature hasn't been natural for a long time. We've been here, Native Americans before us have been here. Um, we shouldn't need to set up this pristine, pre-human reality to measure what we're doing or think about what we're doing, even though that's a, it's a deep American tendency. We love that idea. Um, but it involves erasure of all sorts of things, especially the hand of the Native American, um, who we pretend, we pretend it was an empty continent. And um, so I was taking issue with that. Not, not what he was saying about climate. And, I, I, and, and so climate has found its way into my work in all sorts of ways. In food, it was clear to me back when I was writing The Omnivore's Dilemma, which comes out in 2006, that agriculture had a very important role to play in climate, both positive and negative. Um, the negative we all know about now, we didn't then though, there was very little attention to food as in agriculture as a contributor to climate change. I actually remember um, uh, when Inconvenient Truth came out, um, watching it and like being amazed that there was not a word about agriculture and um, uh, it was all about energy generation, you know, by and large. And, um, and I remember uh, I had occasion to meet um, Vice President Gore at a conference and haranguing him about like, why aren't you writing about this? You could do so much, there's so much, there's so much potential here. And um, he eventually did, I mean, not on my account, but for various other reasons. He, he, he actually has taken a, a, a great interest in the potential of agriculture. But anyway, people who were working on agriculture issues saw this. They understood that meat eating, meat production, uh, had an enormous carbon footprint, beef in particular. Now we all know this, but we didn't know this then. Um, and, but the other side of it was, and, and I remember learning this fact when I was doing that work, when um, Walmart as a company decided to do a, an assessment of their climate footprint, they did a top to bottom uh, analysis of how they did business to figure out what was contributing the most to climate change. And you know what was number one? It wasn't those big box stores they were, that they were air conditioning and heating, and it wasn't that international shipping system. It was the nitrogen fertilizer going on the corn at the base of their food chain oh. that produced all the soda and all the meat and all the junk food. That that nitrogen fertilizer, uh, which farmers put uh, use in excess, 100% excess of what they need routinely as crop insurance, um, but whatever doesn't get taken up by the plant, when it gets wet, turns into nitrous oxide, which is as bad as methane. Um, and that was, their, that was their climate footprint, and they had no idea. Um, so the agriculture piece has been vivid to me, um, but what's exciting about it in agriculture, now we get to the hope piece, um, is that unlike a lot of other areas, agriculture has, the, there's the potential in agriculture not just to mitigate, the, the climate impact, but to actually roll it back um, and through uh, sequestering carbon in the soils. And that was so interesting. Um, you wrote a piece called The Secret Weapon to Fight Climate Change, Dirt, and that was right during COP21. 21. Uh, 21, yeah, that's yeah. right, yeah. And what are some of the facts that came out of that? Well, the first big fact is that um, one third of the anthropogenic carbon in our atmosphere that we're breathing right now 
was in the soil a hundred years ago. <laughs> um, and it has been released into the atmosphere through agriculture, um, plowing and tilling and deforestation um, and fer fertilizer. Um, so there is at least the potential to bring back a lot of that. And how do we do it? And now we all know that trees sequester carbon, but I, people don't really understand how soil sequesters carbon or how plants sequester. And it's an amazing process. I mean, yes, through their bodies, you know, they build their bodies, plants build their bodies out of carbon and, and, and that can be, you know, gets plowed in. But there, there's a, there are two other very important things that happen. Um, the main one is, though, that all the uh, sugars, the carbon produced through photosynthesis, about 60% of it goes to build the plant. 40% of it travels down through the roots and is exuded in the form of sugars into the soil. Why is the plant doing that? To feed its microbiome, to feed the bacteria and the fungi that it depends on. And so it draws all these microbes to it and they circle the roots and they get fed the sugar and then they go off and they are eaten by other microbes and eaten by other microbes and eaten by other microbes and eventually it enters the soil as, as um, stable carbon. And I love that that goes to your idea in This Is Your Mind on Plants that the genius of plants. And yeah. I think so often we minimize plants compared to, and I know especially out west, the charismatic megafauna, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, grizzly bears versus, you know, an, an opium plant right. that you take us so directly to. I mean, well, I mean, yeah, the, the genius of plants has been a theme of my work from the beginning. I mean, I'm just constantly amazed at what they can do and, and you know, how much smarter they are than we are on, on, in, by various measures. I mean, they're better chemists than we are. Well, just the very act of photosynthesis. You Which know, we is, still can't duplicate. No. Right? We, our, our solar panels are crude compared to what they do. You know, some people say, how did Michael Pollan get from the botany of desire, you know, to this is your mind on plants and how to change your mind? And it occurred to me, you know, 2001 with botany of desire, you were talking about the tulip, you were talking about cannabis, you were talking about apples and potato, and 20 years later with this book, you're talking about opium, um, caffeine, and mescaline. Mm -hmm. And it makes perfect sense because in a way you've been looking at plant consciousness and our consciousness all the way along. What I'm interested in is how has this journey that you said was an intellectual conceit, um, how has it become, in your words, um, a felt truth? Yeah. In other words, the journalistic journey becoming a spiritual journey. Well, in Botany and Desire, I, was, I, I talked about how plants act on us. I talk about plants as subjects. We think of them as objects. We think of everything but ourselves as objects, pretty much, which is a big part of our problem and a big part of the environmental crisis. Um, and, but what if you conceive of plants as subjects? Because they are subjects um, in evolutionary terms as much as we are. And a certain class of plants, what we call the domesticated plants, um, somewhat insultingly to them, um, are, um, they act on us. They get us to do things for them by gratifying our desires. So I, I was writing about that symbiosis and the plants are active agents. Um, they manipulate us in various ways. Um, and they do that by uh, you know, feeding us and, and giving us beauty and intoxicating us. And, and um, the plants that figured out that for some reason humans are not satisfied with everyday normal consciousness have done really well. Opium and cannabis are two great examples. Um, it's a really winning strategy. Um, and that speaks to their basic genius, which is for biochemistry, of like the ability to hit on, I mean, think of it, the precise molecular key to unlock the human mind that a plant figured that out long before, you know, our chemists figured it out. And how about capitalism with caffeine? I mean, that just yeah, was well, astonishing in your chapter on caffeine. Well, caffeine has been, coffee and tea, uh, have, have been um, enormous, um, 
midwives to, uh, to capitalism. Um, they have uh, helped create precisely the worker, the kind of worker, which is to say sober, alert, uh, um, hardworking, efficient, that capitalism needed to, to uh, thrive. Um, and that was, um, uh, again, it, it benefited those plants because we then took this, you know, coffee, which had lived in this little ghetto in Ethiopia, and that was its habitat, and now it's in this band that goes around the world. Um, and if so, you ever doubt that you're an addict, I loved your conversation, you know, saying just look at the line that you're standing in at Starbucks at the airport. Yeah, you know. at 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. Well, I saw that because I, I had gotten off caffeine. Um, often in my immersive journalism, I take drugs, but in this case, I had to abstain from drugs, which is much harder to do. And uh, I had this one morning, I went through a horrible period of withdrawal and, and just general discontent and inability to focus. And, um, and there's one moment where I had to get to an early flight, like a 6 a.m. flight, I forget where I was. And I got myself to the airport on nothing more than like mint tea. And <laughs> And I'm walking through the airport, and I'm starting to smell the coffee. And, but there are these lines, because they're just about to open the Pete's and, and the Starbucks, and there are all these people, and they look just like the addicts in Amsterdam. Um, and it made me realize the power of this addiction. So how has this changed you? I mean, with the psychedelics? Um... Well, so going back to the point you made about botany desire, it was something of an intellectual conceit that the, that the plants are actors and they're manipulating us. And, and I mean, I was careful in how I phrased it, but it was not a felt reality. Um, and one of my um, experiences on psychedelics, specifically a psilocybin experience, magic mushrooms, um, in my garden, um, I had a very profound experience of the plants in my garden. It was, um, I had a sense of them returning my gaze. I had a sense of them as actors. Um, my garden is, 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 is a kind of, there's a long spine and there's a, there's a perennial border along one side and it was, a, it was a very warm August day at the end of the day and um, the garden was just alive with that last flash of energy with uh, the bees were doing their work and there were tons of dragonflies and the dragonflies were leaving these contrails all over so there was these lines going through space and the plants were, you know, talking to the bees, me, 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 you know, over here and, um, and I was just aware of their voice um, and their presence and their desires and, and uh, I felt more a part of this scene that I had ever felt in nature before. I might as well have been at a party of humans, you mm -hmm. know? And, um, uh, and it was wonderful. Um, and, you know, most of the time we don't feel that way. We feel slightly alienated. We have one foot in nature, one foot out of nature, or, or both, feet out of, both feet out of nature often. Um, but here I was welcomed and uh, as, as uh, embedded in the scene as any other creature. And I don't know what to do with that in terms of, you know. I mean, when you say that you felt that your gaze was met, um, what do you do with that in terms of that moment of reciprocity? And I would ask you, how did, well, they meet, how did you meet their gaze? How did they meet yours? And how, how do you hold that with the destruction yeah. of hierarchies in a hierarchical structure that, right. that we return to after those moments, those peak experiences. And that's the thing, we do return to the, we, we return to another mode. So the issue is what can you take forward? And that's a big question. I'm, and I'm not sure of the answer. The garden is an easy place because it's reciprocal. Um, it was a beautiful chapter in Robin Kimmerer's book about the beans and love in the garden and how all the attention we pay to this little patch of land is returned to us in the harvest every year. And there's, there's this wonderful, uh, you know, exchange of equals in a way. Um, but in the larger, in the larger sphere, um, I'm not sure of the answer to that. I'm not sure. I mean, I think that one of the, I have to be very careful in, in how we express this, but 
one of the things that I find interesting about psychedelics and the experiences, not only that I've, I've had, that, but that millions of other people have had, is the, the, the way it frequently moves your mind down a certain path. And that path is toward a view of uh, nature as being part of nature, feeling very connected to nature, a general sense of in interconnectedness, um, and a general sense that subjecthood is kind of more d democratically spread over the natural world than, than we normally think. A kind of animism, really, is what it is. It returns us to a kind of animism. Um, and that seems to be exactly what's needed. Uh, to the extent we need a change of consciousness to address the environmental crisis, it should be in that direction, away from egoistic thinking. Um, ego thinking objectifies the other, um, whether the other is nature um, or other people even. Um, and what happens to many people on psychedelics, as the ego, the, 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 the walls of the ego are softened and, and sometimes melt completely, um, that sense of difference, the, 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 the barriers that the ego creates, that, it, I mean, it's, it, much is gained by objectifying things, right? It gives you great power. It gives you the ability to manipulate without any, you know, question. Um, but psychedelics cuts, can cut against that. Now, I say all this advisedly because we don't know how common that reaction is. We don't know how predictable that reaction is. Um, there's a selection bias. The kinds of people who participated in studies that show, they've actually measured nature connectedness. They have, the, the shrinks, of course, have a, you know, have a survey for everything. And, and after a single psilocybin experience, people do feel more that they are in nature, connected to nature, than they do otherwise. They have less, uh, less tolerance for authoritarianism, too. They feel more interdependent. But these samples are very small, and they tend to include people who are, I mean, are willing to do a psychedelic experiment. That's not everybody. So... But then when you think about, and I think Charlie's going to return to this notion of animism, but when you, when you say that's not everybody, when you look at indigenous people, yes. and specifically Stephen Benali and... Um, Sandra Ironrope. Mr. Ironrope. And Davis. Don Davis. Yeah. Um, they didn't want to talk to you about for that reason, you know, because it's very different for them, as I understand it. And they weren't open to having you come to the ceremony. Um, and I was fascinated by this statement of, of yours. Um, I loved this. You wrote, and in fact, their message was, this is cultural appropriation and stay away. And they were concerned about um, the renaissance now of psychedelics, mm -hmm. comparing it to Carlos Castaneda and the 1960s. And the great tradition of white discoverers. Right. Yeah. And what they were saying is, you know, with the overarching appetite now for mescaline in mescaline producing cactus, peyote, mm -hmm. um, they're concerned that the plant would become um, threatened yeah. and the religion, the Native American religion is, is threatened. Um, Anyway, I loved what you wrote. You said, here the appropriation is taking place in the finite realm of the material things, a plant whose numbers are crashing. This puts the eating of peyote by white people in a long line of metaphorical takings from Native Americans. I was beginning to see that for someone like me, that the act of not ingesting peyote may be the most important one. So here's a, a, a note of restraint. Yeah. Um, hold that for a minute. Then I was fascinated that Charlie had um, Mr. Benali and Mr. Is it um, pipe? Rope. Iron rope. Iron rope. <laughs> uh, when Charlie asked them, but we're now being able to produce these, duplicate these, cultivate these plants, peyote, um, in greenhouses, how do you feel about that? And 
I was stunned um, when the answer from Sander Ironrope was, we feel about cultivating peyote in a greenhouse the same way we feel about you trying to cultivate, cultivate the minds of our children in our boarding schools. Mm -hmm. And I, th I thought that was so indicative of the difference between our perspective of plants and theirs, theirs as plants, as brothers and sisters and, and entities. Do you still feel this, this sense of restraint? Or, about peyote? Yeah. Uh, yes, definitely about peyote. I mean, I've declined now a couple opportunities to participate. And um, I just feel that it's very important. So there's a real conservation crisis there. And it's important to understand we can't just plant a bunch of peyote. It takes 15 years to get from seed to usable button. Um, and uh, it's so important to the practice of their religion, to their spiritual life, to their, to their medicine. I mean, that um, to do anything that would encourage people to go down to Texas, it only grows in this narrow band along the Rio Grande, I just didn't want to be involved in any Carlos Castaneda kind of fad for peyote. So I was very explicit. Um, and yeah, I was convinced by what they said. I wasn't convinced that um, I shouldn't describe what happened to the extent that I could, even if I wasn't there. And, and Native Americans were not unanimous in that view. Uh, Stephen Benali didn't feel, uh, you know, he was like, he was incredibly, it was a really interesting moment for me as a journalist. Um, you know, we go out there and we just assume, we ask people, and when they don't talk to us, they're usually hiding something <laughs> or, or something. And generally, if people talk to you, they answer your questions. And that he was looking at me through such a particular lens, because I had written about psychedelics, I was a white man, um, and that, that uh, and he had wanted nothing to do with that in terms of... And then in a way, it was commodifying the sacred. Yeah, I mean, in a way, I mean, that's a, I mean, that's a, that's a very tricky issue, but we can come back to that. But, um, I took the point. And, you know, part of this is that white men are not used to having an identity. <laughs> We've only gotten one in the last few years. <laughs> and, um, and, but it made, it, it made that very stark and made me very aware of that when I'm going into an interview situation. And I appreciated um, with your identity, with your privilege, that you did say restraint is the, is the call for action. Yeah, I, I felt very strongly that that was... We have a, a question from Donna, and I want to read this. She says, newly emerging Western psychedelics culture and what seems to be a successful attempt to legalize these substances again by reframing them as treatments for depression, anxiety, etc., may be stripping them of much of their ancient meaning. Mushrooms were introduced to us by Maria Sabina, a Mazatec curandera. In Mazatec language, there are no words for stress, anxiety, and depression. As those who have lost that connection to our healing plants, as described in the book, and are roaming in search of our practices, what can we learn about constructing our own ceremonies that cultivate respect for these plants, and not only respect the way science tells us they change our brain chemistries, what are we losing with this new way of engaging with its plants if we take them out of their context ceremonially and put them into clinical trials? It's a great question. Um, you know, the, the medicinal path is the most obvious one for Westerners, and it's no accident that that has produced the most uh, support and interest in psychedelics, as we've demonstrated them using our placebo-controlled double-blind studies. Um, this is what passes for authority in, in our culture, uh, the, the word of science. And when I wrote How to Change Your Mind, I focused on science because I, un I understood that very well. I was borrowing that authority to tell my story. Um, and it was in, when I was writing this book in between 2015 and 2017, you know, there was a real question whether it would be taken seriously by anybody. And um, it was a pretty fringy subject. And um, so I did what, you know, any journalist would do, which is lean heavily on science. And, um, and plus there was interesting science happening. Um, I did not write about the shamanic use of these plants, except in passing. There's a couple ayahuasca ceremonies that I allude to, but for, you know, very superficially. 
um, because I thought that would undermine the authority of the book. Um, but, I, but I was learning just how much we had to learn from the traditional use of psychedelics. And that we got into some difficulties with psychedelics in the 60s. They, you know, burst upon the scene seemingly without a history. Um, and LSD did not have a history. It was very new in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and we didn't know how to use them. They came without an instruction manual. And they were often used recklessly. I mean, the CIA did crazy things with psychedelics. Um, but people did too, you know, spiking the punch bowl. You know, what a weird, and again, cruel no thing to do. And again, no ceremony, no ritual. No, no ceremony, no ritual. And, um, but we didn't know what these things were, what they were capable of, or how to use them. We were too arrogant to, to realize that there was an instruction manual. Um, and that was the traditional use of psychedelics, going back more than 6,000 years in the case of peyote, but um, uh, a couple thousand years in, in Central America with psilocybin. Um, and we stripped it of that context, um, to, when, to the extent we knew about it. We, knew, we did know about Maria Sabina. Um, and, um, so do you see new yes. ceremonies so, coming forward? I think, there, well, there's three that paths. Appropriating, yeah. Well, that's the hard issue. It's like, can you learn from another culture without appropriating? I think you can, mm -hmm. um, but it's a tricky issue. I mean, I don't know that you know Steve Benali would agree, um, but there are the, the really the deep structure of ceremonial use, which isn't tied to any one particular uh, indigenous group involves a couple things, and this seems to be consistent. And this is really work for a comparative anthropologist, but um, psychedelics are seldom used alone. They're usually used in a group setting. There is, they're, not, they're never used casually. There's always a sense of occasion, intention, purpose. Um, there is always an elder involved mm -hmm. who knows the territory and can help people navigate difficult passages. And there is always ritual ceremony involved. So those, I, I lost count, four or five elements seems to me things you could adapt, borrow. The rituals would have to speak to our culture. Um, what constitutes an elder is for us to figure out. But used in that way, these substances are very safe and can be very beneficial. Um, and, and so the challenge is for us to devise a container that has those elements, but speaks to us in our moment. Do you feel that what you call the white coat shamanism is moving in that direction? Well, medicine draws on shamanism through the white coat, right? I mean, we, we, we give this magical authority to doctors, um, and they know it. And, you know, they have white coat ceremonies at, at the end of medical school. They know exactly what they're doing. Um, but I envision uh, a path that's outside of medicine um, where people because there are other reasons people do psychedelics. Um, they can use them for spiritual growth, uh, to solve various problems. That people needn't be mentally ill to benefit from them. So I think that there will be, uh, the, I, th I think of that as the third path. The second path is the religious path, the straightforward, there will be new churches. Uh, they're already found, there, there are new churches around psilocybin, and there'll be churches around LSD, and they will seek approval uh, as churches, and they will call them not psychedelics, but entheogens. Um, and I think the chances are good that with this Supreme Court we have um, defining religious liberty so broadly that even corporations needn't do things they don't believe in. Um, uh, they'll be hard pressed to turn down these churches when they come along. So, so along the lines, I have two questions before we turn it over to Charlie. One, you talk about democratizing psychedelics because in the white coat shamanism, um, it's largely in the realm of the privileged, you know, to be able to have microdosing or to do psilocybin with a doctor nearby watching you. Um, what does that look like? Well, 
I think actually this medical path has the potential to expand access beyond where it is now. Because if psilocybin or MDMA therapy is proven to be effective in phase three trials, and MDMA has already passed a phase three trial, um, it will be covered by insurance eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, and that will make it accessible um, to, uh, to more people than have access to it other ways. Um, right now, you know, underground therapy is very expensive because um, demand exceeds supply and there's no insurance. Um, so I think we have these access issues are very, very important. And, um, and psychedelics has to move out of the generally affluent white community it, 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 it's in right now. But there's signs that that's happening. I mean, I see a lot of signs that's happening. And I guess, Michael, we could talk for hours, you know. Um, what I'm really interested in is, you know, you're a deeply public person. You have enormous um, influence and sway. I mean, your books do create movements and they are catalysts for change. Has this been a spiritual transformation for you? And if so, how? I mean, one of the th things you talk about is the dis the dissolution of the ego. Yeah. And in an experience like that, what role do you see psilocybin, you know, um, mushrooms, LSD, this renaissance of psychedelics, what role can it play in expanding our mind and notion of where we are in this climate crisis? So, how has it shaped your views and how has it changed you spiritually? Well, I'm going to answer the latter question. The other one, we need like another hour. Um, so I, I began this whole investigation into psychedelics as a confirmed non-spiritual person. I didn't understand the word spiritual. I really didn't. I assumed that to be spiritual was to believe in supernatural things. And I was very much a, you know, materialist, uh, physicalist um, in, in my outlook on things and was very suspicious of, of other ways of looking at things. Um, I, had a, I had an experience that was very powerful, um, not the one I described in the garden, but another one of complete ego dissolution followed by this sense of unitive consciousness of, of, of merging with some larger entity. In this case, it was a piece of music that I became one with. And um, I experienced what it was like not to have a self. Um, and, you know, on the survey I filled out, it was a spiritual, it was a mystical experience. Um, and it certainly felt like one. Um, but was it supernatural? I don't think it was. Um, and it caused me eventually to rethink or reinterpret what the word spiritual means. And I came to the understanding that, that spiritual experience is simply, at least for me, I'm not speaking for everybody, uh, an experience of profound connection to something outside yourself, um, such that there's no inside and outside. And that the opposite of spiritual is not material, as I thought. The opposite of spiritual is egotistical. <laughs> and is the ego that stands in the way of spiritual experience. And to the extent that you can transcend that, yes. So in that sense, I feel I'm, I'm a much more spiritual person than I was. Um, but I haven't left nature behind. <laughs> and how, if you don't mind just giving us the last word on this, what are the implications? What are the spiritual implications, implications of that egoless state? for a deepening of our sense of this climate crisis and our participation in it. Well, this goes back to the idea whether the, you, can, you can prescribe a drug for a whole culture. And I, and I have my doubts that we can do it. I think that psychedelic experience can contribute to the crisis or to solving the crisis by letting people have these experiences of non-duality, of, of realizing that things they objectified are very much alive, of reanimating nature. Um, but how widespread that can be, it's hard to say. I think we have to do research, you know. It, until we see that the Koch brothers react the same way to psychedelic experiences, 
you and me, <laughs> I would be loath to give too much of it away. Um, uh, but you've talked about tribalism and the environmental crisis. Yeah. That this does open the mind to it's, be able to see this in a, in a more it holistic does. way. We have, for individuals, it seems to do that. Um, but there's a real question of how, how do you, you know, you don't put it in the water supply. Right. Um, so how, how, what do you do with that? I mean, it, it does take us where we need to go in, in, in the case of, you know, many individuals who try it. And it may underlie also the, the environmental ethic, if you will call it that, or the animism of of indigenous peoples who've used psychedelics for thousands of years. The, the psychedelics may have taught us to look at nature that way, and it may still be able to, to, to teach us. But I, I just don't want to be too, I don't want to be overly hopeful about this, just because there's so much more research we need to do till we prove out this idea. But it's, it is, it, it does give me hope, and it does seem like maybe there's a reason this is coming along right now. Um, and I was very heartened to see that, you know, it has inspired people in the environmental movement. The, I forget her name, the, the woman who started the Extinction Rebellion in, uh, in England uh, was inspired by a psilocybin experience. And um, so maybe it's something that can nourish this movement. Thank you. I cannot wait to see where you go next. And we will be <laughs> I following. I can't either. <laughs> um, I want to introduce um, Charlie staying to us. Um, Charlie is the director of the Center for the Study of World Religions. He's a theologian with a BA from Harvard, an MDiv from the University of Chicago, and a PhD from the Harvard Divinity School. His research and teaching focuses on early Christianity. He's particularly interested in the development of metaphysics, mysticism, and monasticism in the ancient world. And he's the author of numerous books and articles. His most recent are Divine Double, which I found fascinating, published in 2016 by Harvard University Press. You'll find this interesting. He's on the board of directors of the Eslan Institute. And at the center, Charlie spent the last couple of years focusing on cutting edge programming, specifically around the psychedelic um, renaissance and religion. And this year, the Center for the Study of World Religion inaugurated a new research initiative called Transcendence and Transformation, studying religious, spiritual traditions and practices, building on this work. So Charlie, over to you, my friend. I can't wait to see how you deepen and broaden the conversation. Thank and I you, love Jerry. you, Michael. And I want to say hello to your mother. Okay, so, quirky. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Charlie. Hey, Charlie. Hi, Michael. <clears throat> Pleasure to be here with you, Terry. Thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you for the team who have helped pull this event together, yes. an in-person event, no less. And thank you for the class who has come to this uh, to this event. Um, I love that meeting together in, in uh, real life has now become a heroic endeavor. I know, very exotic. <laughs> yeah. So Michael and I met for the first time about just a few weeks ago, um, my wife Sarah and I had Michael over for dinner with uh, Brian Nurescu, uh, whose book, The Immortality Key, was the next hugely popular book on psychedelics after Michael's How to Change Your Mind. Brian shared a story that I want to share with everyone assembled. So forgive me, Michael, you've already heard this. Uh, the Gospel of Mark is the earliest of the four canonical gospels in the New Testament. And the very first command, the very first imperative that Jesus utters in that gospel is, in, in its original Greek, is metanoieta. It's often translated as repent. But it really simply means change your mind, change your noose. So just pause for a moment and let that sink in. <clears throat> the first thing Jesus tells us we have to do is change our minds. Mm. So Michael, one thing I want to say at the outset is that you're in a very, very good lineage. Jesus is a great ancestor. <laughs> I'll say. <laughs> and uh, today is the day of the dead, and we remember our ancestors. And we'll come back to ancestors later. So um, much of what I had hoped to introduce has already been introduced, so this is great. And the question I had hoped to pose to you I think has in some sense already been answered, so the question will have to change 
under my feet. So I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes, which will eventuate, I promise, into question. Okay. <laughs> okay. I promise you all. So in your new book, uh, This Is Your Mind on Plants, you speak of a of humans' universal drive or urge to alter their consciousness, to very intensify and sometimes transcend our normal everyday consciousness, which evidently we feel is not enough. And the book, of course, is about how plants satisfy that desire. But how is that so? Why should it be that plants so perfectly serve to alter our consciousness, as you were already asking? Are they, in fact, serving us? or we them? Is service the right way to understand that relationship? What are plants to us, and what are we to them? Or should I instead be saying, who are plants to us, and who are we to them? And what's at stake in that simple shift in an interrogative pronoun from what to who? So Michael, I want to invite you to cross a threshold I sense you may be hesitating on this threshold. The door is already ajar. You left it open in the introduction of the book. Here's the passage I have in mind. You write, the stories I tell here put this trio of psychoactive plant chemicals into the context of our larger relationship to nature. One of the innumerable threads connecting us to the natural world is uh, the one that links plant chemicals to human consciousness. And since this is a relationship, we need to account for the plant's point of view as well as our own. How amazing is it that so many kinds of plants have hit upon the precise recipes for molecules that fit snugly into the receptors in human brains, and that by doing so, these molecules, molecules can short circuit our experience of pain or rouse us or obliterate a sense of being a separate self. You have to wonder, what's in it for the plants? to devise and manufacture molecules that can pass for human neurotransmitters and affect us in such profound ways. So, not surprisingly, the phrase that leapt out to me when I read that paragraph was the plant's point of view. Point of view suggests perspective, agency, wishes, designs. Just now we heard you speak about the genius of plants. We use that word genius today to mean a kind of clever reasoning. But in Roman mythology, a genius is a tutelary deity of an individual, something closer to a guardian angel. You've spoken of subjects versus objects, that we need to acknowledge plants as having subjects. And although you speak of amazement and wonder at the relationship between humans and plants, when you do turn to the plant's points of view in this book, you largely speak in the safe idiom of evolutionary biology. Plants are very clever. They have devised ways of relating to humans so as to maximize their spread. By way of contrast, two of your informants in chapter three on mescaline, who have already been mentioned, take a different tack on the plant's point of view. Here's Dawn Davis. She says, it's hard to talk about how important and sacred this medicine is, especially to people who see the plant as a thing. To me, peyote is sentient. The plant is not a thing, but a relative, an elder. And Sandor Ironrope says, the medicine knows you before you even know yourself. It's like a mirror. This medicine is a mirror that allows you to see inside yourself into the core of your heart and spirit. The peyote knows you. Now, I confess that the comments of your two informants resonate with a host of authors and books that have walked not exactly through these halls here in Schwartz Hall, but across the street in the Center for the Study of World Religions in the past five years, during which time I've had the privileged to direct the programming there. So these are just names of some people in their books, books that have changed my mind. Um, Eduardo Cohn, How Forests Think, Toward an Anthropology Beyond the Human. Robin Wall Kimmerer, Braiding Sweetgrass. David Abram, The Spell of the Sensuous. 
and his uh, second book, Becoming Animal. Richard Powers, The Overstory. Michael Martyr, Plant Thinking, a vegetal, I'm sorry, a philosophy of vegetal life. And Graham Harvey, Animism, Respecting the Natural World. Now, with the exception of Michael Martyr, and for reasons I can explain, all these authors adhere to what I think we might call an animist worldview. You've already mentioned animism. But I think it might be helpful to recall that animism is a category with a very, very ambivalent history. It was marshaled in the 19th century uh, by anthropologists as a means of grouping whole sets of worldviews, often non-European indigenous worldviews, worldviews that regarded the non-human world or the more than human world, animals, plants, mountains, rivers, stones, as persons rather than things, right? As whose rather than what's. This was their crucial error, according to the European anthropologists. Such people regarded an inert thing as having a soul or an anima, and thus a person of some sort. These people couldn't properly distinguish things from persons. So these traditions were grouped under the category of animism precisely to demote them, to figure them as primitive, as early evolutionary stages along the way to theism, from poly and then to monotheism. So according to this 19th century thinking, if you encounter animists today, they're atavist, atavistic. They're holdovers from an earlier stage of human spirituality. So you can imagine how the category of animism is very amenable to a modern European settler expansion. It allows you to control the worldviews of um, all kinds of people. So it's a pejorative category in its inception. But like another pejorative category, queer, it has been, or it is in the process of being reclaimed by scholars and practitioners alike. And here I'd point uh, anyone interested to Graham Harvey's Handbook of Contemporary Animism, which is a huge collection of contemporary thinkers and practitioners. Harvey's definition of animism is this. Animists are people who recognize that the world is full of persons, only some of whom are human, and that life is always lived in relationship to others. Animism is lived out in various ways that are all about learning to act respectfully, that is carefully and constructively, towards and among other humans. I'm sorry, other persons. There, I made the error again. Other persons. So I'm inviting you to cross the threshold, but the truth is, I'm already on the other side. Mm -hmm. And it's now, in our intellectual environment, incumbent upon us to announce our positionality. So I'm an animist. Um, and lest anyone think that by announcing myself as an animist, I am appropriating uh, an indigenous tradition that I have no business appropriating, I want to insist that there is a deep animist root in the West. Animism goes back to the origins of Greek philosophy. I mentioned earlier ancestors. Here we are, the Day of the Dead. Let's name and acknowledge our animist ancestors. Very proximate, we have some of them down the road at Concord. Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau mm -hmm. are local animists. I walk the same woods and I swim the same waters as they did when the weather permits. And further back, as I said, animism is at the very inaugural moment of Greek philosophy in the 6th and 7th century. I'll just mention one, Thales of Miletus, who writes famously in a fragment, everything is full of gods. When everything is full of gods, you have to relate to things quite a bit differently. Now, sometimes animism flies under a kind of kissing cousin called panpsychism, which is also enjoying a revival of interest in philosophical circles. Anima and um, psyche are the words for soul in Latin and Greek, respectively. So the, my contention is, rather than being 
um, the purview of uh, only some traditions. Animism is everywhere. The question I thought I was going to ask you, Michael, <laughs> was are you an animist? <laughs> uh, I, hiding in plain sight. The answer to that evidently is no. And yet, you've spoken of how catalyzed by, I think, psilocybin, at the very least, you enjoyed a thrilling afternoon as an animist. But then it came down and it left you. <laughs> Too bad. Sad. Um, no, Sad. no, but the, 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 the question I now want to ask you is this. You, you said in response to Terry, animism is what's needed. You seem to me a classic, like you're, you're um, I would, uh, if anyone's going to become an animist, it might be you. You're a gardener, <laughs> first of all. Gardeners, I think, are highly susceptible to animism. They are. Um, but even if you want to hang on the edge of the threshold and yet suggest, as you just have, that crossing the threshold is precisely what we need, then the question I want to put to you first is, how do we, forgive the pun, cultivate animism if it's, what's, if it's what's needed? Well, I don't know that I'm not an animist, I, 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 but I have so many questions that I'd have to answer first. I mean, and one is the question of consciousness. Does personhood imply consciousness? And if so, what kind of consciousness? Those are really hard questions. Mm -hmm. Panpsychism, which I have been reading about, posits an incredibly um, paltry concept of consciousness, that there's some, that even particles have experience at some level that's almost unrecognizable as experience, um, and that you build up from there to more complicated creatures, and then you get psychism like ours. And um, so it doesn't seem like an entirely satisfying uh, idea, or, or it, it, it's kind of shorn of animism, actually. It, it's, a, it's a very denatured idea of panpsychism that seems to be on offer right now. But it's interesting. It's really interesting. Um, so I, I guess my answer would be, I don't know enough to say. Um, I see a lot of animist tendencies in nature um, and in my own attitudes. Um, but I think that, you know, I just don't know enough to say. I mean, it's, it's, it's for investigation. Um, I've read some of those authors, not others. There, there was a very interesting moment when Richard Powers was being interviewed by Ezra Klein a couple of weeks ago. It was a fantastic interview. If you haven't heard it, I highly recommend it. And he's kind of like, what's wrong with anthropomorphizing? <laughs> um, by which he meant animism uh, in that case, and, and, and imputing human or qualities of personhood on other things in nature. And you could argue that the scientific revolution, you know, for the last 400 years has been the exception, um, that that is the retreat, the only big retreat from animism in the history of mm. human thought. And, um, uh, and maybe it's a passing fad. Um, <laughs> it's coming back. <laughs> well, it I sounds think like it, the way you has, describe it, it's coming back. I think, to be fair, it's not just the scientific revolution. I think the history of Christianity in, in Europe. Yeah, the mo yeah monotheism, too. Was, yeah, the, there are yeah. ways of w in which monotheism and polytheism is, are absolutely compatible with animistic worldviews. Yeah. But, and it raises the question of whether there was popular animism in Europe alongside an anti animist ecclesiastical elite, but certainly the organs of elite Christianity have not been, have been hostile, hostile to, to yeah. animism. So I wouldn't lay it entirely yeah, and, and, and many other tendencies too. Capitalism too, I mean, doesn't have any use for animism. Nope. It's a huge threat. Um, and I do think that that way of thinking, whether it's formal animism or, or something, mm. or, or animism light, um, is important to the kind of revolution in consciousness we need to think about nature in a different way. 
Um, and it isn't surprising that people who think hard about nature and are environmentalists are, are more inclined in that direction. Um, you know, it's, it's a matter of degrees. If you, if you respect other species, you know, I mean, I, I began attributing these, these qualities, but I was also very wedded to this Darwinian framework, um, which I wouldn't be so dismissive of. <laughs> it's been pretty useful. Enormously powerful um, exp explanatory scheme. Yeah. And, and Darwin himself, of course, was, was he an animist? Probably not, but he also had animist tendencies. And when you read him on worms, um, and, you know, <laughs> no, he's very, you know, his worms are, you know, very alive. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, genius, too, has another meaning, too, uh, that I know from the history of garden design, which is spirit. The genius of the place is about the spirit of the place. Mm -hmm. And plants do have spirit. Right, but what does it mean to afford them spirit? And, and like, how do you prove animism? I'm not sure that, uh, that animism affords that kind of proof. So then we just, so then the question is, where do you put science? And, and, and what framework are you using? And, and yes, I still, I still use that framework in a lot of my work. Well, that was what I wondered whether, I wondered whether you were a secret animist. <laughs> Closeted Sad, animist. Yeah, I thought you were a closeted animist. Uh, and that I might be, I don't know. You might be. And that perhaps your reluctance to cross the threshold was strategic in the hopes of reaching or continuing to reach the wide audience mm. that you do. And that you might lose someone, a great number of people, by crossing the threshold. Sadly, no, no one reads my that. books, so I don't really have anything to lose by announcing myself I think that animism. there is a, a, it may be secret, but a hunger for animism. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people feel a hunger for animism, and mm -hmm. that they, uh, um, so I think they'd be happy to read somebody who was animistic. But this brings me my, maybe my last question on animism, which is, when I laid this out, and truth be told, fair enough, I did lay out books. You said, I've read those books. Not all of them. I've, no, 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 I don't, I, it's not that. It, we're talking about books. So animism is not just a theory, it's a practice, which is right. why I thought you might be a secret animist, uh, because you actually have a very robust and lifelong practice of gardening. Mm. And often I feel as if it is the theory that has to catch up to the practice. Of that's, well, that's often true. So maybe yeah. your theory just hasn't caught up with your practice. That could be. That could definitely be. Um, yeah, I, you know, we're just talking about very different frames of reference. And I'm very interested in this question. I've actually been thinking a lot about where does consciousness begin in, you know, in, in animals and in plants and how can we define it. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I wrote a piece on plant intelligence a few years ago and it was astonishing what, um, uh, you know, plants can learn and remember. Uh, I had no idea of that. They're as good as, you know, Pavlov's dogs in terms of um, uh, actually learning from experience. Um, but does that translate into consciousness? And then we have to wonder, well, why should our kind of consciousness be the only kind? Maybe plants have their own kind. Well, this is I mean, why. We're, we're projecting this model of to be conscious, you need a brain. Um, but um. slime molds, you know, can do amazing things with, and, and octopuses do it with a, do incredible things with a distributed brain. Um, so we're very limited by the tools we use to understand mm -hmm. these questions. I do think we need to decouple personhood from things like brains. Um, yes. And uh, the question as to whether it's animals and plants that are persons, um, or other beings, like stones. This, um, well, hmm? well, stone. Well, yes, here's no. a great. I Animus can't remember. In Graham Harvey, in his book on animism, he starts with the story of a of a, a Western, an American linguist of Native American languages, and he goes to. I think it's an Ojibwe elder. I can't remember exactly, and says to him, "Are stones persons?" And the elder looks at him and says, "That's a, 
That's a really dumb question. Some of them are. <laughs> All right, I think maybe with that, we should come to a close. Michael, thank you so much for entertaining this. Uh, thank this, you for this, this question. question. And thank you for um, writing these books. These last two have been companions of mine this past year. It's really a pleasure to. And thanks for the work you're doing around these issues here. I think it's so important. There's, there are very few environments I step into where I'm accused of not going far enough. Well, <laughs> you're welcome anytime. <laughs> Thank you. I think with that, we will bring our time with Michael to a close, and we will return to Brian at Theosophy to conclude the evening with tea ceremony. I don't know. 
in you. You know. Plane after plane will open to you. I want to know who I really am. As if in each of us, there once was a fire. Some of us, there seem as if there are only ashes now. But when we dig in the ashes, we find one ember. And very gently we fan that ember. Blow on it. It gets brighter. We've lived our life totally involved in the world. Sponsor, Harvard Divinity School, The Constellation Project, The Center for the Study of World Religions, Religion and Public Life, Theosophy Tees, The Planetary Health Alliance. Copyright 2021, President and Fellows of Harvard College.